through Sunday and later into Monday. Take a look at the picture first thing, and there is some mist and fog across southern parts to watch out for this morning. Also some cloud and outbreaks of rain across eastern northeastern parts of the UK. Elsewhere, it's a largely dry and sunny picture. The cloud in the northeast should break up a little bit, so increasing amounts of sunshine as we head into the afternoon. And in that sunshine, feeling pleasantly warm. Temperatures may be a touch higher than yesterday, with highs of around 16 or 17 Celsius. Across parts of Northern Ireland, it is going to be a bit cloudy and that cloud increasing as we go through the day with winds strengthening here too because of this front trying to push in from the west. We will then see a few outbreaks of rain here later on and some outbreaks of rain for western Scotland overnight too. Otherwise though it's looking like a largely dry night, perhaps a bit cloudier than some recent nights. As a result it may not be quite as cold though there's the potential for a touch of frost in the most prone spots where we get any clear skies. So Sunday then, getting off to a dry start for most of us. There will be some outbreaks of rain through the morning across parts of Scotland, but they're going to clear their way northwards. Otherwise, and whilst it will be a little bit cloudier than recently, I'm expecting some decent sunshine, particularly across England and Wales, as we head through the middle part of the day. Temperatures with that sunshine will again be on the warm side, so highs of around 17 or 18 Celsius. But notice this wet weather arriving from the west. That's then going to sweep its way eastwards as we go through Sunday night into Monday, bringing a real change to something more unsettled through the rest of the week. There's the potential for something stormy to arrive later Tuesday into Wednesday, with temperatures taking a bit of a dip too. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit off. Well, you are. You, that's you, my you, you, <laughs> My political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing, go on. He's probably gonna want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree, that's what we like on Jubes and Co. Come and join us, GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubry, weekday evenings at six o'clock. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
We've got a brand new lineup every Saturday night on GB News. From 6 p.m., I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8 p.m. as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Brand new Saturday nights on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good morning and welcome to Saturday Morning with Esther and Phil. Now, do you hear this, Phil? Their favourite married couple. Your favourite married couple, maybe, maybe not, here <laughs> on GB News, as we've got lots coming up for you this morning. Indeed we have. We'll be joined by Frank Lampard's uncle, former football manager legend Harry Redknapp, to discuss the return of Frank as the caretaker manager of Chelsea. And we'll also be reflecting on the legacy of Baroness Margaret Thatcher, as today marks the 10-year anniversary of her passing. And we'll be looking at the big stories of the day as the news unfolds with former special advisor to Michael Gove, Charlie Rowley, and former head of broadcasting for Labour, Matthew Razza. And as ever this morning, we want to hear from you, so get involved in the show. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. But before we start, here are your latest headlines with Ray. Thanks to you both. Good morning. It's one minute past ten. Here's the latest. The Foreign Office is calling for a de-escalation in tensions between Israel and Palestinians after British citizens were caught up in a series of attacks. One Italian tourist was killed and eight people, reportedly including UK nationals, were injured after a car ploughed into pedestrians in Tel Aviv. Meanwhile, two British Israeli sisters were killed in the West Bank after their car was targeted in a gun attack near an Israeli settlement. Their mother is also in a critical condition. More than 850 community and charity representatives from across the country have been invited to the King's coronation on May the 6th. 450 recipients of the British Empire Medal have been asked to attend the service at Westminster Abbey. Meanwhile, 400 young people will watch from the adjacent St adjacent Margaret's Church. They were nominated by the King and Queen Consort and the government. Marine Constable Dawn Wood of Essex Police told us that she'd initially received the invitation by email. I initially opened it. I thought, who on earth is playing a joke on me? There's, <laughs> there's going to be... I'm going to find out that I'm going to turn up to the palace and I wasn't really supposed to be there. But, uh, yeah, I've made a few phone calls since and, um, yeah, so excited. Absolutely. I just can't believe that I've been, um, been selected. What an honour. Labour says tens of thousands of serious offenders have been spared jail while the Conservatives have been in government. The party claims that since 2010, more than 16,000 adults convicted of child pornography offences and 130 rapists have been handed community punishments or suspended sentences. Labour has previously faced criticism after it published a social media post which accused Rishi Sunak of not believing that child sex offenders should be locked up. A 26-year-old man has been charged with the murder of a Romanian woman in Northern Ireland. Gila Ibram, also 26, was found at a home in Limerick on Tuesday. Her body was identified by her family yesterday. The suspect is due to appear today at Belfast Magistrates Court. The United States is promising to train Taiwan's armed forces as China continues military exercises around the island Beijing claims as its territory. The chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Michael McCall, also pledged to speed up the delivery of weapons, saying it's important that democracies stand together. China's military drills began a day after Taiwan's president met House of Representatives Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Earlier today, 42 Chinese fighter jets briefly crossed into Taiwan's territory. Staying with international news, and North Korea has conducted tests on an underwater nuclear attack drone, according to the country's state media. The test is the latest show of force against the US and South Korea. Photographs aired by state broadcaster KRT show the drone exploding beneath the surface. 
comes just a week after North Korea first disclosed that they had the technology designed for sneak attacks in enemy waters. Well, back here, nine in ten teachers say their workload has increased over the last year. According to a new survey, teachers work an average of 54 hours a week, with around 13 of these outside of the normal school day. The teachers' union suggests that 83 per cent believe that their job has adversely affected their mental health over the last 12 months. Chris McGovern is chairman for the Campaign for Real Education. He told us teachers deserve better pay. Teaching is an energising job, or it should be, and if it's depressing you, you shouldn't be in the job because good teachers have to be happy teachers, and of course happy teachers have to be well paid. But you know, within the school budget, there is a plenty of money to pay teachers a good salary. The majority of staff in schools are not teachers, so we need to shift some of the money from the non-teaching staff to the teachers, and we could solve the problem. But that's called thinking outside the box, and the Department for Education, which I've advised over decades, isn't very good at that, I'm afraid. You're watching and listening to GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Now let's get straight back to Esther and Phil. Thanks, Ray. And to take a look at the top stories of the day, we're delighted to be joined in the studio by Matthew Lazza, former head of broadcasting for Labour, and Charlie Rowley, former special advisor to Michael Gove. So, Matthew, do you want to start? What's your story of, uh, of today? Well, I think it's hard to avoid. It's my party's um, uh, tweets uh, of yesterday, which uh, not only did they have one, but they had two that they've doubled, they've doubled down on using a very personal style of attack uh, to target Rishi Sunak uh, on crime, which has put the cat amongst the pigeons, both within the party as well as getting a lot of criticism from outside. Certainly, we've got The Guardian is <coughs> not happy. Uh, but interestingly, um, uh, the Mail has David Blunkett, um, uh, obviously a former Labour Home Secretary and seen as somebody on the traditionalist wing of the party who might be expected to support a kind of tough-on-crime campaign, criticising the way it's being done. So, so um, what was the thought process going into the these tweets? Well, I think, uh, and actually, as, uh, as GB News' own Tom Harwood said, it's, 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 it, it's a kind of, um, just, some people call it dog whistle, other call it sort of below the line uh, attacks that you see in America, or particularly Australia, which is where both Australian Labour Party, I'm, I'm a partly Australian, so <laughs> um, I keep quite close touch with them, you know, have, uh, they were battered for years by the Linton Crosby ta tactics that the Tories have adopted uh, over recent years. So I think that Labour's been listening to what the Aussie, Aussie Labour, without a U, has been saying. Uh, and the idea is, you know, to basically put your tanks on the enemy's ground. It's seen crime traditionally been seen as a weak spot for the party. So, um, you know, the party thinks it's got a strong offer, so it's very much going on the offensive. Now, the, uh, the style in which it's been done is what's raised the questions. I think it's perfectly fine to take the attack to your enemy, but, uh, or, or to try and capture ground that hasn't historically been yours. But there are questions about this. But just the, the two things that struck me about it. The first is about uh, going for this particular issue about sentencing, when, of course, Keir Starmer was on the sentencing yeah. council that was responsible for the sentencing guidelines, which was, you know, you could be accused of leading with your chin on, on that, couldn't you, really? I mean, it's a, it's a sort of a, a, a brave one to go down. That's, yeah, brave's a polite weapon. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the second bit is, and I'd be really interested to know what you think about this, is, is the, attacking Rishi personally. Because all the opinion polls suggest that Rishi Sunak is more popular than the Conservative Party yeah. brand. So if you were now advising the Labour Party, would you say, look, don't, go, don't attack the person who's the most popular, don't go for the person who's actually the most popular bits, go for the brand which is really unpopular? What, what, what's your view on, on whether they should be yeah. going for the brand or the person? I think on, uh, on, on Keir's involvement with the DPP in politics, because now most people come to politics having uh, spent a lifetime in politics. Now, that's another issue, I'm sure, we debate another day. But so often we look at their record, it's within politics, we know about it. But actually, Keir comes with a huge amount of uh, a track record and back in a very serious job, a very complicated job. And I think the party's got to be careful that when it's thinking something through, it thinks about what Keir did before, what his involvement is. And I think maybe that hasn't happened in this case. And it certainly is going to be a subject, you know, a lesson for them going into the election campaign. So I'd say, Charlie, so far, it's it's done what it's set out to do. Everybody's talking about it. People know these figures uh, about who is or isn't sent uh, to prison. They're leading uh, the charge of the Labour Party. Uh, but will it unravel 
And will they come to regret this personal attack? Uh, I think they will. And I think you're right. Everybody is talking about it, but they're talking about it for the wrong reasons. Um, the, the, the image itself, I'm just looking at it here. You know, do you think adults convicted of sexually assaulting children should go to prison? Rishi Sunak doesn't. That is a lie, of course. Everybody in politics, and I think the public can see through this, that whatever your political persuasion, whatever colour or, uh, uh, or political stripe that you vote for, uh, I think most people, most fair-minded people, accept in this country that uh, most politicians want better health services, they want uh, better schools, they want better hospitals, they want to see uh, criminals of this nature locked up. So to suggest otherwise, I think is taking the public... But it's, but it's, but it's not just the cut and thrust of, of politics, though, mm. and, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Labour would say, well, hold on a minute... The Conservatives had a go at Keir Starmer for not prosecuting Jimmy Savile. Mm. Uh, what, what, you know, is you can't start belly aching now when the tables are turned. Well, you're absolutely right to point out, first of all, that you know, it was uh, Keir Starmer that was, uh, when he was Director of Public Prosecutions, he was there, uh, part of the Sentencing Guidelines Committee to make sure that actually criminals do face tougher sentences, uh, and they didn't. Um, but you're right also about where do you park the tank? I'm all for political attacks. That's the nature of the beast. That's the world we all live in. Um, but uh, the reason why the Labour Party have gone specifically for Rishi Sunak and have targeted him, targeted him uh, because the Conservative Party brand, after the last couple of years that it's had, is slightly uh, downing the doldrums, and because the polls are suggesting that it is neck and neck between who would make the best Prime Minister between Sir Keir Starmer or Rishi Sunak, they're worried that Rishi Sunak uh, is neck and neck or yeah, I totally ahead. agree. So you'd want to try and pip off, as it were, the person who's the most Absolutely. popular and bring it together with yeah. the Conservative Party. That's what they're doing. And they've doubled down. Phil, what were you looking at? Well, I mean, I, I just, just I, I, I'm not sure it's the best strategy. I'd try and make it, if I was the Labour Party, I'd try and make it about... But they've doubled down now, talking versus about... versus Labour, guns, not Starmer uh, versus... Guns, I think the idea crime. is to try and make him sure that he isn't Teflon man, to remember that he has, he has been part of the government and it's not just, it's not emerged from nowhere. He was, you know, OK, he was out during the, uh, the, 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 the most chaotic months, but he was there for, throughout the, um, the last 10 years. Now, I've got a story here, which I, it might be a bit more fun, but I'm not sure it is that much fun, actually. It's page 24 of the Daily Express. Bosses offer young uh, finish early Fridays. Uh, so bosses apparently are trying to coach younger workers back into the office with early Friday finishes, invitations to summer festivals, holiday incentives and days off on birthdays. This is... Um... For most of us, a wage was good enough. You could go in to have <laughs> exactly. a job. No, not good enough now. All kinds of bribes because you can't get yourself out of bed and into work. But apparently after COVID, people don't want to do a full week in the office. And um, at Zuma said that there were 1,426 job adverts online citing early finish Fridays. Um, <laughs> what do you think, Matthew? Well, I think it's quite... Are you we... into early finish Fridays? Well, I, I, I mean, I think what's interesting is we've seen, you know, all the trouble the tech companies in California have been getting into, and apparently they're cutting, you remember the sort of free breakfast and smoothies onto app and unlimited coffees that actually, you know, people... I mean, it's the first thing that Elon Musk did when he came in for Twitter, it's kind of tuck out the free coffee machine. I think we've got to get a balance here, um, uh, uh, and I think that it is it is finding your finding way, but it seems a bit gimmicky to me you, to have a... You see, early. you, you know, what, said Dress Down Friday used to be enough oh, for us, wasn't it? Absolutely, that was a great treat. Yeah, no, that was not, a treat. Now it's go <laughs> home early on, on Friday. I've done Dress Down Saturday. I've done Dress Down Saturday. Yes, yeah, dress down Saturday here on, the, on this particular point, though, I, I know a colleague of ours in Parliament who advertised for a caseworker and got zero applicants, zero applicants mm. for the job. <laughs> Uh, so they then advertised for... You're sure that was just about the job? Well, well <laughs> and not the college. It, well, it, it is because uh, they then re-advertised it as a working-from-home job and they were inundated with applicants mm. for the same job just so they could work from home I instead. So are these employers onto something with early finish Fridays? Um, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Look, I'm a traditionalist, but I was always more productive being in the office. I think that's where you just... Um, it's better, it's healthier probably, because you're talking amongst work colleagues, you're getting things done, you can actually... You know, um, you, you're not actually... I think you could actually be quite unhealthy working from home all the time because you get distracted with your home and your work-life balance and it becomes a bit of a, an <laughs> amalgamation. Friday fridge day, but, munching from the it, fridge, getting more <laughs> snacks. Exactly. But I think what people... Ultimately, employers and businesses want to know is about their productivity. So if they've got a happy workforce, if they're being productive, yes. if the output is there, that is the most important thing. And whatever balance you can strike, and if it works for the employer and the employee and the productivity is there and you're growing or producing whatever it is or achieving the results and that are set, then it, in, it in, can't in, be In a different way, you know, I've got to think of the social aspect yeah. of going into work. It's where most people find their partners. It's where most people get the friends. They go on holiday. Mm. They go for drinks after work. I mean, it's not just the work. It's all of that. 
That's why I'm is at it, work. Is it, <laughs> I think he's not turned up. I might find a partner later on for Easter. <laughs> but, Matthew, isn't the key thing with this is that if you make your place of work a fun place to work, if an employer yeah. makes it a fun place to work, then people will want to be in the office, presumably. I don't understand. This is like saying we're going to make it's going to be such a miserable place we to work. get out of it. So yes. you're going to want to leave early on a Friday. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's all about. I think productivity is the key, and it's about what makes common sense. I mean, there is the scourge of the open plan office. Um, yeah, uh, 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 I was one of the first people. working the BBC building in Salford, where we where somebody got disciplined for leaving a stapler on their desk because you were not. Never mind photos of the family. You know, <laughs> they were they weren't allowed to leave a stapler because you had to clear it all overnight. Oh, okay. No, that wasn't the problem for me. I just. <laughs> Sometimes find open plan just too noisy. Exactly. So I do like my quiet too space. And so yeah, so if I wanted to write something, going how you know, working, for, concentrating and writing something, with, you know, for, for, for when you had to get a deadline worked, but it's about getting that balance right, isn't it? And certainly you don't want to be stuck at home on your tod all the time, do you? Charlie and from Page exactly here of the Times. From Page here of the Times. I was going to say, if you don't turn up to work here at GB News, you might get a note from Jacob Rees Mogg for the coming round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get into work. Look, we can zoom that interview. But from Page of the Times, as you say, this is um. Uh, a department that both of you and I have both been, uh, been in, in housing. Housing targets scrapped. And in the run-up to the local elections, I think housing is obviously um, uh, an issue that's important to uh, a lot of people, local people. Um, the government has a target of trying to build 300,000 homes a year. Now, I think it's a slightly open secret that that's a modest target at best if you're going to build the homes that you need to meet the demand, whether that's ownership, home ownership, or whether it's a, a flourishing private rented sector to bring rents down, to allow people that flexibility. Um, the, there are 55 local authorities that have scrapped their local plans altogether. Local authorities have got to have housing projections and plans in place, as I say, to in, ensure that they're building the homes for the future and for future generations. There's always a, a conflict between the local authority and what is the planning inspectorate, which marks your homework as a local authority, as it were. Um, and sometimes I think those rules um, haven't been flexible enough. say 300,000, a moderate target. That's for the number of houses that we need. But to actually build yeah. that many, you never really, we've never really got over in the in recent times over 150,000 because actually it's finding the land, yeah. uh, the planning permission, and everybody wants them built elsewhere, exactly. not, in, in not uh, next to them. And this is what's happened here. It's the local authorities are saying, no, we're not going to be building that many homes. Exactly. And, and that's the balance that I think you know, we, we all grapple with because I think it's perfectly legitimate and right to say to local authorities that they will know their housing projections better than anybody else. They are in control. They should have the authority and the autonomy to go and uh, 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 make the numbers that they need to make. But then you've got to go and build them. And if you don't build the homes that you need for the future, then that's when it becomes a little bit tense between so, uh, local Matthew, government and central government. This must be a big issue for the next general election. Housing, housing for Absolutely. young, affordable housing. Absolutely. And I also think if, 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 if as uh, you know, it looks uh, it's possible we have a Labour government, there's going to be a huge clash between a Labour government, uh, which is A, committed to localism, and B, is facing a lot of Tory local authorities, uh, it, it, particularly in the southeast of England, in the Shire counties, uh, where these houses, where, that, where the demand is, is biggest. There's going to be a massive clash so there. So there's localism, they might all be saying no, but the status, you know, the central Labour yeah. party was trying to force it upon it, and those are the tensions. Absolutely, which I think are really Will you grow. overcome that, though? I, I think, Will I think it be it, driven by the centre? I, well, I think it's going to, I think it's going to be a, a real clash because what you're going to see, as you say, is, is everybody saying they don't want them in their backyard. You're going to see lots of... If, if, if Labour wins the election, it's going to see lots of Labour... First-time Labour MPs who are suddenly going to find they've got a 10,000-person petition, person petition <laughs> you know, that they don't want a housing estate built on that on that beautiful field there. Yeah. And yet, essentially, they're going to be saying, build, build, build. It's like tractor production targets. It never quite happens, does now, it? lots of people might uh, be at home here saying, well, hold on a minute, it's not more houses that we need. It's a better control of immigration that we need because that's fueling a lot of the need for... For housing, is, is there a danger that politicians are looking at this problem from the wrong end of the telescope? Well, I think I mean it's immigration isn't the migration isn't the only thing that drives demand. But yes, I think absolutely. I mean, because people reading this at home will be thinking you need a you need to, a, a, an immigration policy which has had which is the government has got a grip on. Now, whatever we think of what's happening at the moment, and whatever we think of future ideas, I don't think even uh, the government's uh, you know kindest uh, uh, supporters would say that a grip has been got on migration. So yes, absolutely. Let's see the, let's see processing happen and people stand home, which is what Labour's been pushing for. Struggle for Labour to say no. 
we can't have, whether it's 40,000, 80,000 coming over on boats, so they might have to look at the Rwanda policy, whether they say we can't have half a million people coming in, that is going to be a big issue. I was going to look at this, uh, compare two different royal stories, as it were. On the Daily Mail, you've got Kate found walkabout with Harry and Meghan, one of the hardest things she's ever had to do in her life. So sort of questions what she's <laughs> ever had to do in her life. <laughs> this is a new book coming out, and it's really more whinging, I'll call it. The whining winds is this, you know, you know, Harry always moaning that, you know, not enough help or support's gone to him. He seemed to be whining to the Queen on the phone, swearing at his father, etc. And then on the front of the Daily Express, you've got the King invites hundreds, making UK great, great to his coronation. And that's at the adult side of the royal family, trying to reach out and be, um, the, you know, the royal family for the country. So... You know, which is winning, but the younger whiners or the adult elders? Oh, the adult. In the public's mind. I, I think the adult elders. I think, you know, everybody has got behind um, King Charles. Everybody's looking forward to the, the coronation and everybody wants to see, you know, uh, the first family of the UK and the Commonwealth, you know, the king. They want to see that coronation. Go so we don't smoothly. want they to want... see Harry and Meghan then at the coronation. Uh, Have they said yet if they're coming or not? No, no. Next few days, about. Oh, my goodness. This is, this keeps is going on and on and on. It's keeping us waiting. Though, isn't it, Matthew? I mean, Kate found walkabout one of the hardest things she's ever had to do. But to put that... I, mean, I, think that's, I, mean, that's... I think that's ridiculous. I think that's, I think that's not a particularly wise briefing. It's a shame because I think you're absolutely right, Chai. I think that the, uh, that the adults ha have been winning. I think what's uh, been absolutely extraordinary because... Because of, uh, of 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 the book and the interview uh, uh, from Harry, but also just generally, is since uh, uh, since the Queen's death, is how the sort of liberal lefty opinion has decided that actually they're okay. You know, the, uh, uh, sort of losing faith with Harry and Meghan. So I think that the uh, the traditionalists, as it were, are winning partly because they've shown that they're prepared to modernise. I love the Queen saying uh, the phone calls from Harry were becoming wearisome. <laughs> Please call your father. Block the number. Yeah. <laughs> Block the number. Call your father. Not me to whine on about what you need. Thank you both very much Thank indeed, you. Charlie. Matthew there, you'll be back with us a little bit later on. Thank you. Now, coming up, we'll be speaking to footballing legend Harry Redknapp on his thoughts on the announcement that his nephew, Frank Lampard, is returning to manage Chelsea. And don't forget to listen to us on GB News Radio if you're going to have to <laughs> pop out of the house. You certainly won't want to miss Harry Redknapp. See you soon. Hello there. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office. I'm Jonathan Vautry. Many of us started the Easter weekend on a fine and dry note, and that is set to continue into Saturday as well. It's thanks to high pressure that is situated across Scandinavia and extending across the UK, bringing us these dry conditions, keeping those weather fronts at bay. There is, though, a bit of a tightening in those isobars, particularly across western locations, so it will be a breezier day today across Northern Ireland into northwest Scotland as well. A bit of higher base cloud as well, making the sunshine hazier here. Some cloud lingering across coasts of northeast England into Scotland as well, but gradually breaking up as we move throughout the day and many of us will have a good number of sunny intervals and when you are in that sunshine it will be feeling pleasantly warm highs of 15 to 17 degrees celsius above average for the time of year into tonight many of us will hold on to those dry conditions just the chance that some of the cloud across northern ireland may produce the very odd light shower and we will see the cloud gradually push its way back into eastern locations as well particularly as we head into the early hours of sunday morning but with the continued breeze around and that cloud temperatures probably dropping less so than with previous nights in many towns and cities holding up around five to six or seven degrees Celsius. That cloud in the east just providing a bit of a murky start first thing on Sunday morning, but again, it will gradually clear its way off as we head throughout the day. And much of Scotland, England and Wales will again see a fine day with some sunshine, again, turning a bit hazier as we head into the later afternoon. So temperatures slightly up compared to Saturday again, perhaps reaching 18 degrees in places, but it is going to be more widely breezy for all of us. And again, the wind strengthening in the west as we now see the rain pushing its way into Northern Ireland and Scotland later on in the evening. Some heavier bursts possible, certainly as we head into that overnight period. This also signals a change in our weather as we head into the new week and things are looking to turn more unsettled quite widely, particularly Tuesday night into Wednesday could bring the risk of gales. Enjoy your day. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to. 
by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools, we know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. <laughs> my political ambitions are, those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We've got a brand new lineup every Saturday night on GB News. From 6 p.m., I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8 p.m. as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Brand new Saturday nights on GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Saturday Morning with Esther and Phil. The time now is 10.27. And to the world of football. Yes, yesterday it was announced that Frank Lampard is to make a return as caretaker manager at his former club, Chelsea. And we're delighted to be joined now by his uncle and football managing legend, Harry Redknapp. Harry, thanks so much for, for joining us this morning. Um, it seemed to come as a bit of a surprise in the footballing world, Frank's appointment. Was it a surprise to, to you and a surprise to him? Yes, I, it was. Yeah, to be honest, you know, I, um, you know, obviously, it had the spell at Everton, and you know, I, I was wondering whether Frank would actually what his future held for him in management. Would he come back in again, or would he maybe work in TV or whatever as a pundit? But uh, he just loves. I think he's, he's football is his life. I think he wants to be in there managing, and um, so when this opportunity came, I mean, it was just fantastic for him to go back to Chelsea now. Uh, they've got Champions League quarter-final coming up with Real Madrid, home and away. I mean, what two incredible games to take on. Um, and plus, you know, starting at uh, this weekend with Wolves away. Um, he's got a great opportunity. It's a, If he can go there and do well, maybe whether he gets the job or not at the end of his, uh, his you know, this, this, this tenure that he's took on, um, you know, he can, he can re you know, really build his reputation again, which is important, I think. I'm sure he'll be uh, on the blower to you for your advice, Harry. But, look, I mean, look, you you famously returned to Portsmouth for a second stint as manager. I, I just wondered how yeah. difficult is it to to return to a club again, to go back uh, being manager for a, for a second time? Well, uh, you know, I think, I mean, Frank is a... I, mean, I know we talk about legends at football clubs and whatever, but he is actually he is a true legend at Chelsea. I mean, he's... He was one of the his elite all-time leading goal scorer for the club. He just was an incredible player for them, and they they absolutely love him there. The fans love him, so I'm sure they'll be delighted. They they you know um, 
if he can go there and, and you know, hopefully, you know, take beat Real Madrid and give them a real good run in the league, the fans will be delighted. They, they, they've got so much respect for Frank. So, yeah, it's a great well, opportunity Harry, for him. If he, and, uh, Harry, if he did call you, what would your first bit of advice be? Walking back through those doors again. I mean, I, I don't know, but I would imagine yeah. that would be really nervous. Are the things that you, you might say... You know, what he's got to be aware of, cautious yeah. of, the fans maybe. Well, uh, yeah, oh, well, the fans would love him. It's not a problem with the fans. I think when he goes in the dressing room, he's really got to lift the confidence. Uh, they've got incredible group of players. I mean, they've spent a fortune on players and they really have got some great talent there. So I think what he needs to do is to give the place that he go in there, be bright, put a smile back on their faces start getting them winning a few games again. Confidence is key. Um, and just give the place a lift, really. And I think if he does that, there's, there's no magic formula in terms of coaching or anything else. You know, it's a case of really lifting the spirits, getting a few of his, you know, building up now for this uh, for today's game and then the Real Madrid games. Um, and confidence is key. You know, they say they've got the talent. They've just got to put it together. And he's got to pick the right team, the right blend. It's all right having 11 great individuals. He's got to make sure he can blend them together and pick the right, the right group to go and win some games for him. And, and how difficult is it to have the authority that you need as a manager when you're just a caretaker manager? Does that, does that make his job more difficult? Um, I don't know. I've never been in that position. But, I mean, it's... Uh, listen, the players have got to go out. They've got their pride to play for, as I say. And, and they're still in a great... OK, they're not going to make top four this year. That looks out at the picture. But they can, when you're in the quarterfinal of the Champions League, I mean, with, with a game against the great Real Madrid to come, you know, it's, uh, it's a great... There's so much to play for still for Chelsea. So uh, the players have got to be performing. Otherwise, they don't play. If, it, if they're not playing, they, they won't get picked. So they're, 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 they've got pride in their... They've got to take pride in their performance. And Frank's got to just give a place of lift. It seems, Harry, that, um, the, that we've had a record number of sackings, it seems, in the Premier League this season. It seems that the players seem to have more and more power in, uh, in, in Premier League teams, more power than the, the manager often has. Um, did you, I mean, was that always been the case? Is, is, is that getting worse? I mean, did you have any particular player that was a nightmare to, uh, to deal with, the, to, 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 to manage? No, I, I think it has got harder. I mean, the players are earning so much money now. They're, they've all got... Oh, hang on, Barney wants his dinner. They've all got his breakfast. They've all got agents. Um, so it, it is getting tougher. But, uh, you know, it's it's still the same game. You still... You hold, still you have the power. If you're the manager, really, you, you can, can decide just, whether they play or not. Can I just have... I know a final question here. I know it's a tight family and you're a close uh, family and I know that you supported Frank when he was looking for romantic advice with uh, Christine Bleakley. So I'm just wondering, what do you think's best? <laughs> your romantic that. advice sure or your footballing that. advice? What, what advice would I give him? No, I said, what's better, your romantic advice or your footballing advice? Oh, my football advice, I would imagine. Listen, he's... he's, he's He's a happily married man. He's got a great family life there. So, uh, but I would, I hope my football advice is, is still good, you know, and my advice to him is go and be yourself. And, you know, it's been amazing in football recently. We've got Neil Warnock gone back in at 75 years of age at Huddersfield and t turned a team that couldn't win a game into winning three games off the, off the spin. Roy Hodgson's gone back in at, uh, at Crystal Palace. So... Frank's a no, young Harry, man. He's you, got going back in. you need you need to get back in at Spurs, Harry. That's what I'm you ready. need. They, they need ready. you at Spurs. I'm ready for a comeback, myself. Yeah, the Spurs. That's what they need you. Okay, you heard it I'm here ready. first. I'm ready. I'd walk back there. Brilliant. Yeah, heard it here first, Harry. Harry Redknapp, back to Spurs. Thank you very much indeed for joining See us this guys. morning. Bye bye. Now look, it's Easter weekend, and what better way to celebrate it than with chocolate? And we're delighted to be joined now by Master Chocolate Tia uh, Oliver Dunn, aka. Ollie the Chock. So, <laughs> Ollie, right, fantastic Hello, to see you. Hi. What Happy makes? Easter. Happy, thank you very much. What makes a great Easter egg? We use the best Belgian chocolate. You know, it's all about the cocoa beans that come from Ghana in Africa, of course. So, yeah, we, we source the best chocolate we can. And, of course, it's made with love.
Oh, so love is what makes it a great Easter egg. Well, I saw a fantastic story in the paper here today, and it's our 83-year-old egg is too nice to eat because it was a mum oh, gave yeah. it to her son in 1940 to commemorate her son joining the army, and they've never eaten it because, mm. obviously, so much love. Yeah. Is there ever an Easter egg you wouldn't eat, Ollie? Oh, I'm a chocoholic as well as being a chocolatier, which is quite frankly uh, lethal. But, um, you know, I can totally understand that with people keeping it. A lot of people do. Like, I make chocolate shoes, like high heel shoes, and people keep them. A lot of people don't eat them. You'd, you'd be quite surprised. And chocolate does last as well. So it's nice that, you know, people feel so attached to it that they, they don't want to eat it. We've got pictures of you here making a giant Easter egg. I don't know who'd eat that one. It looks like the size of a small child. I don't know. My little girl would actually fit inside that. It's like two foot tall, weighs about eight kilos. Great fun making it, as you can see in the video. But, you know, that's part of my passion is being able to share what I do on social media. So, good, all good fun, playing with chocolate. I've heard of birthday cakes or wedding cakes where people jump out of it, but I've never heard of an Easter egg where a child cracks through it. <laughs> I just I wondered. Think it's got uh, to be a new one. <laughs> I, I just wonder, Oliver, how, how big um, is yeah. Easter in, in the, in, during the course of the year for the for the chocolate industry? What what proportion of sales does Easter make up? Well, Christmas is the big one. Um, you know, Christmas is um, I'd say probably eighty percent of sales um, in in the calendar. But you know, Easter. Uh, is is behind that, you know, it's um, nowhere near that, to be honest. But it's it's a big one. Everybody loves chocolate at Easter. It's the it's the main attraction. So we get lots of people coming in the shop for from small eggs, you know, with with hats on to great big two foot tall personalised. People can have their own chocolates put inside, and uh, yeah, it, it's a fun. It's a crazy time for us right now. Ollie, Ollie the Chock, <laughs> thank you very much indeed <laughs> exactly. for joining us today. Fantastic. I'm well, going to ask... Put a cheap one aside, Ollie, so I can, uh, I'm coming and buy one for Esther, but not too expensive, if you uh, don't mind. Now, listen, I've got here 80 to 90 million chocolate eggs are sold in the UK, and each child gets roughly eight Easter eggs. Hey. That's what they'll <clears throat> roughly be eating. So, quickly, before we, we, we go to break... Childhood. Charlie, are you expecting loads of Easter eggs? Uh, not loads, but I am partial to a cream egg, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, just, just go back to keeping eggs. Uh, you know, when you could first get your name on them, I first got mum on it, and my mum kept it for the whole year until the next Easter and did that every year from then on, when you could first get your name, your name I on it. I remember, it was that Thornton's It was Thornton's when you could first get it. Well, what I did, the sneaky trick of pretending I hadn't eaten the Easter egg, but all the back had gone. <laughs> so you saw the front, but all the back had gone. Well, anyway. After a while, you, you don't want to eat it, do you? I mean, I wouldn't want to eat an 83-year-old Easter egg, <laughs> would you? I mean, after so many years, you think, well, I'm not going to eat that anyway. I think there's a limit. <laughs> it's, it's, well, it's historic, that, isn't it? It's historic. But anyway, coming up, should you avoid a prison sentence if you are under 25? Massive question mark there. Outrage has sparked across Scotland after a young man avoids going to prison due to Scotland's new sentencing guidelines. Of course, it's the 10-year anniversary of the death of Margaret Thatcher. We'll be joined by Sir Gerald Howarth, who was her parliamentary private secretary. Stay with us. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you And whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we 
get out of it. Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Oh, Back oh yes. Morning, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 10.40. Uh, lots of views coming in, particularly about housing. Brian says it's all right building thousands of homes, but what about the services to support those homes? Uh, say the sewerage system, etc. Everything, isn't it? Roads, housing, schooling, everything. GP mm. surgery. David says we need new housing and to reduce immigration. There are so many brownfield sites that are, sites that are just derelict, both government and privately owned. Build on these first and then see if we need to impinge on greenfield sites. Lots and lots of views about that, keep them coming in. Now, furious sparked across Scotland as a man now in his early 20s has received only a community sentence after he raped a 13-year-old girl when he was 17. Guidance was introduced last year designed to keep young people, that's those under 25, out of prison wherever possible. Because the brain, is what they're saying, is not fully developed. But should youth be considered as a get-out-of-jail card when committing such a horrific crime? Join us now to discuss this is the founder of Yes Matters, Gemma Aitchison. Gemma, thank you very much for, for joining us. What do you make of this idea that people shouldn't be sent to prison because uh, if they're under 25 because their brains aren't fully formed? Is there, is there anything in that at all, do you think? Um, well, EHCPs for children and young people with... Uh, learning disabilities and mental disabilities go up to age 25. So in terms of those children and young people that have those mental disabilities, I can understand that. Um, however, not really in, in the criminal justice context at all, no. I mean, this was a particularly horrific uh, crime. He, uh, he threatened her, he seized her by the wrists, he forced her to carry out a sex act before raping her, a 13-year-old girl. I mean, that is... Horrific. The judge said, and, and I'd be interested in what you think about this, Gemma, the judge said that if he was over 25, he would have got four to five years in prison, which still seemed pretty uh, uh, lenient to me. But the judge said, prison does not lead me to believe this will contribute to your rehabilitation. And because he'd got no previous convictions, he thought that therefore not sending him to prison was the right thing to do. So I, I suppose the question is, what's more important, rehabilitation or punishment for a serious crime? Well, I don't really think it's for the victim to have to suffer because our criminal justice system isn't doing rehabilitation properly and rehabilitation isn't being invested in properly. Why should that, that young girl have to suffer the consequences for that? And the thing that I find really, really concerning is that rape is a serial and escalating offence. So it isn't a case of, is he going to be a danger? He will be a danger. He will do it again and he will do it worse. So what that judge is responsible for is not only failing that victim, but also the future victims of this man. 
Do you think rape as a crime isn't taken seriously enough? It, absolutely not. If, if we look at the conviction rates, you have less than 2% chance of even getting to court. And in, it takes years, as, as in this case and in most cases, it takes years and years. And then when they get there, they're told, oh, even if you've been proved you have done it, oh, don't worry about it, mate, you get away with it. It just reinforces this message again that what happens to women and girls doesn't matter, and that's something that women and girls, particularly in Scotland, I believe... Is that about evidence-gathering, though? Is that the principal problem? Um, I think there are a lot of factors. Um, I think pornography is a factor as well. Um, the average age of exposure to pornography in the UK is now seven years old. So if boys are watching these increasingly violent pornography and believing they're supposed to be copying them, um, then boys can then say, well, I believe she consented even though she was crying, even though I was strangling her, even though I was hitting her. So there are a lot of contributing factors like that because you have to prove that the perpetrator knew the victim didn't consent. So it is a complicated issue. Gemma Aitchison, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. And, uh, I mean, I think it's a shocking case. I think it's a shocking I mean, it's a, case. But sends, that, out a terrible, but sends out a terrible message, doesn't but it? But that sentencing change in Scotland, to me, is alarming. That, oh, your brain isn't developed by 25, therefore we don't want to send well, you there. Well, they the, did a consultation of that in 2020, and while most people there, like Gemma said, rehabilitation was important, 81% opposed that change to sentencing. And I oppose, I, I don't know what our viewers think. You know, if you've done the crime, you do the, the time. The, the, the irony is that they're not sending people to prison on, up to 25 because they haven't got fully functioning brains, but they lowered the voting age to 16. I mean, if you can work out the logic behind that, then you're doing better. And if you're any... old enough to vote and take a big say on what the Absolutely. country's doing, you're old enough to go to and prison. And to take responsibility And to take crimes. responsibility Absolutely. for your actions. Anyway, we'd love to know what you think about that. Now, the Yorkshire seaside town of Scarborough has been crowned the best place in the UK to visit this Easter by holiday rental company Airbnb. The resort town has been popular with holidaymakers from across the country ever since the discovery of spa waters in the 17th century. I didn't know that, by the way. And joining us now to tell us why the town is so popular is our Yorkshire and Humber reporter, Anna Riley. Anna, are you enjoying yourself in sunny Scarborough? Are you dipping in that spa water? <laughs> I haven't yet tried the spa water, but I've certainly picked a good day for it. I'm in Pease Home Park at the moment. You might be able to see the dragon pedalos behind me. And Pease Home Park actually was voted the 25th best park in Europe, according to TripAdvisor. So yes, plenty to see and do in Scarborough. You've got the parks, you've got the beaches, you've got some great restaurants, great for the fish and chips here as well. And I've Anna, been out and about in the park. It seems to me, I don't want, I, I want, don't want to stop you mid-flow, Anna, but it seems that your volume is quite low. So we're going to leave you in happy Scarborough and we're going to come back to you a little bit later on. So uh, we'll move on to our next story because today marks the 10th anniversary of the passing of Baroness Margaret Thatcher. Well, we're joined now by Sir Gerald Howarth, who was her parliamentary private secretary and worked closely with her. So, uh, what we want to know is what sort of lady was she? Some people will say formidable, some people might say forensic, some people might just say plain scary. What did you think of her? Well, good morning, Esther and Philip. How great to see you. And uh, two great Thatcherites uh, uh, staring me in the face. Absolutely wonderful. Happy Easter to you both. Yes, she was all of those. Although scary, I wouldn't quite say, but she was formidable. Uh, she was really the salvation of the nation because she rescued Britain from its post-war decline, basically put an end uh, to socialism, made socialism then unelectable. Of course, things have changed. But uh, uh, secondly, of course, very importantly, she restored Britain's prestige abroad as a result of the Falklands uh, campaign and her determination to restore the Falkland Islands uh, to the Falkland Islanders after the Argentine invasion. That sent such a signal to the rest of the world. Don't mess with us. Made the world a safer place. Again, there are some lessons to be learned today. Um, but she, uh, uh, she also, of course, helped with Ronald Reagan and, and uh, Mikhail Gorbachev to end the Cold War. So all those Eastern European countries which are now liberated, all of them owe their liberty to Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan and uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. Um, 
Gerald, it, it looks as if you've got a shrine to Margaret Thatcher <laughs> being, uh, be, be behind you there. Uh, so it, you've, you've certainly come prepared for the... It looks as if Margaret Thatcher there should be in a Bond movie. Yeah, you've got, like, a cardboard yeah. cutout of her. I, I, I just... Obviously, you worked... You worked uh, I mean, you might want to tell us what some of those... That memorabilia is, but, you know, you work closely with her. Have you got any particular uh, favourite or abiding memories of her? Yes, I mean, it was the most enormous privilege. I was elected in 1983, by which time, of course, she'd already been in office for four years and started the Thatcher Revolution. So I was one of the foot soldiers. So I didn't know her very well at that point. Um, but then after, about the time that she uh, she was evicted from the leadership by the Pygmies in the Conservative Party, from which the party took 20 years to recover, uh, I then became her parliamentary private sector and became very close to her. I mean, the others are much closer than me, but I did have the privilege of being working very closely with her. And a number of things stand out. She was so principled. She didn't read the media. She didn't read the news. She relied on Bernard Ingham to give her the briefing on the news. What she did was to do what she believed to be right for her country. And she was motiva motivated by firm principles. Uh, defense of the realm, obviously first and foremost, sound money, private enterprise. She unleashed the unleashed the, the enterprise revolution. She privatized all those uh, nationalized industries which were losing money hand over fist, costing the taxpayer a fortune. They then all contributed uh, to the, uh, the revenue of the treasury instead of sucking money out of the treasury. And of course, she tamed the uh, militant trade unions and restored them to their members. So it was a fantastic Gerald, contribution. Why does yes. she divide opinion so much? What do you think that's about? Because she was so emphatic in her in her views and in her the way she ran the country. And I think that clearly that did divide people. And of course, we do have a very liberal left-wing establishment in this country. I can safely say on GB News that the BBC is fully representative of all that. They basically don't have the guts that she had to do what they believe to be the right thing. And it was that determination to do what she believed to be right that I think uh, drove her and drove her government. And perhaps at the end, uh, it, 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 it resulted in some of her ministers feeling that she had gone uh, too far. But Gerald, she was great fun. Just, just, just quickly, Gerald, um, you were a PPS uh, after she finished as Prime Minister. I just wonder how bitter was she about the way that she was removed from office? And, and what did she make of John Major, which must have been a, a subject of uh, much discussion with you at that time? Well, he was a great disappointment to her. She thought that he was a Thatcherite. And, of course, he flipped between uh, being, you know, this was continuity or this was time for change. Um, but she, she was pretty bitter. She used to refer to him, the man from Cold Harbour Lane, uh, was what she repeatedly uh, said uh, about him. She distrusted him on Europe because she had begun to realise that actually what the European Union, or the EEC as it was, then was, was all about, was creating the United States of Europe, and she resented that bitterly. And, and Gerald, said, just uh, quickly, just quickly, what would she make of the woke agenda? Well, I think we'd be very disappointed, and indeed we would fight against it, because we're conservatives and we believe in conserving all that is good and great about our nation. That's what she would be doing, and I think that it is a crying shame to you two who are there in Parliament uh, taking the Conservative whip that it is under a Conservative government that we are seeing all this wokery. And I had to go with my son-in-law, James Cartledge, so you have a word with him in the lobby. Uh, they have 19 staff in the Treasury who are involved in the diversity and inclusion nonsense, costing about a million pounds. Well, the Treasury could save money by sacking those 19. Gerald Howard, thank you very much indeed. I just wondered what Margaret Thatcher would think of woke and she'd be getting rid of woke. That's what you said. Thank you so much for sharing your memories. Now, we're going to go back to the fact that the Yorkshire town of Scarborough being crowned the best place in the UK to visit this Easter by the holiday rental company uh, B&B. Let's go straight to uh, Anna Riley there. 
Hello, yes, I'm in P-Zone Park in Scarborough, which actually voted the 25th best park in Europe, according to TripAdvisor. And speaking to people here today, they've said they're not surprised that Scarborough's been named the best place to visit this East in the UK they say it's a tranquil place you've got places like parks you've got the beaches you've got the clear water the North Bay it won the blue award um, which which it means great um, uh, water quality and people say there's lots of friendly people here and it's just a great place great for a staycation and the locals said they love it too Anna, thank you so much for, for joining us. As, as, a, as a Yorkshireman, I can, I'm always keen for people to go and visit Yorkshire. And the thing about Scarborough is it's very hilly, it's very hilly, but they do great, great fish and chips. <laughs> well, we've got lots more coming up in the next hour. So uh, we'll be joined uh, in the studio by our punchy panel to discuss more stories, more breaking stories as they unfold. That's Matthew Lazar and Charlie Rowley. Plus a very special guest, a professional chef who has just been invited to King Charles's coronation. Hello there, welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office, I'm Jonathan Vautry. Many of us started the Easter weekend on a fine and dry note and that is set to continue into Saturday as well. It's thanks to high pressure that is situated across Scandinavia and extending across the UK bringing us these dry conditions, keeping those weather fronts at bay. There is though a bit of a tightening in those isobars, particularly across western locations, so it will be a breezier day today across Northern Ireland into northwest Scotland as well. A bit of higher base cloud as well, making the sunshine hazier here. Some cloud lingering across coasts of northeast England into Scotland as well, but gradually breaking up as we move throughout the day and many of us will have a good number of sunny intervals and where you are in that sunshine it will be feeling pleasantly warm highs of 15 to 17 degrees celsius above average for the time of year into tonight many of us will hold on to those dry conditions just the chance that some of the cloud across northern ireland may produce the very odd light shower and we will see the cloud gradually push its way back into eastern locations as well particularly as we head into the early hours of sunday morning but with the continued breeze around and that cloud temperatures probably dropping less so than with previous nights in many towns and cities holding up around five to six or seven degrees Celsius. That cloud in the east just providing a bit of a murky start first thing on Sunday morning but again it will gradually clear its way off as we head throughout the day and much of Scotland, England and Wales will again see a fine day with some sunshine again turning a bit hazier as we head into the later afternoon. So temperatures slightly up compared to Saturday again, perhaps reaching 18 degrees in places, but it is going to be more widely breezy for all of us. And again, the wind strengthening in the west as we now see the rain pushing its way into Northern Ireland and Scotland later on in the evening. Some heavier bursts possible, certainly as we head into that overnight period. This also signals a change in our weather as we head into the new week and things are looking to turn more unsettled quite widely, particularly Tuesday night into Wednesday could bring the risk of gales. Enjoy your day. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. 
Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, good morning and welcome to the second hour of Saturday Morning with Esther and Phil here on GB News. We've got lots coming up for you this hour. SNP auditors resigned yesterday, adding fuel to the financial investigation. But is this affecting the party in the polls? Holstrom Professor of Politics Matthew Goodwin will join us. And we'll be joined by a local community hero who's just received that special invitation to go to the King's coronation. I haven't got to uh, my post yet, never know. Could be one there for uh, me. I, I doubt it. I doubt, I doubt it. it too. <laughs> and of course, we're still joined by former special advisor to Michael Gove, Charlie Rowley, and former head of broadcasting for Labour, Matthew Lazar, as we discuss the new stories that's got us going this week. And as ever this morning, we want to hear from you. So get involved in the show. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. But before that, here's the latest headlines with Ray. Good morning, it's one minute past 11. Here's the latest. The Foreign Office is calling for a de-escalation in tensions between Israel and Palestinians after British citizens were caught up in a series of attacks. One Italian tourist was killed and eight people, reportedly including UK nationals, were injured after a car ploughed into pedestrians in Tel Aviv. Meanwhile, two British Israeli sisters were killed in the West Bank after their car was targeted in a gun attack near an Israeli settlement. Their mother is also in a critical condition. More than 850 community and charity representatives from across the country have been invited to the King's coronation on May the 6th. 450 recipients of the British Empire Medal have been asked to attend the service at Westminster Abbey. Meanwhile, 400 young people will watch from the adjacent St adjacent Margaret's Church. They were nominated by the King and Queen Consort and the government. Marine Constable Dawn Wood of Essex Police told us she received her invitation by email. I initially opened it. I thought, who on earth is playing a joke on me? There's, <laughs> there's going to be... I'm going to find out that I'm going to turn up to the palace and I wasn't really supposed to be there. But, uh, yeah, I've made a few phone calls since and, um, yeah, so excited. Absolutely. I just can't believe that I've been, um, been selected. What an honour. Labour says tens of thousands of serious offenders have been spared jail time while the Conservatives have been in government. The party claims that since 2010, more than 16,000 adults convicted of child pornography offences and 130 rapists have been handed community punishments or suspended sentences. Labour is facing criticism over its latest campaign. The party has previously accused Rishi Sunak of not believing that child sex offenders should be locked up. A 26-year-old man has been charged in Northern Ireland with the murder of a Romanian woman. 
Gayla Ibram, also 26, was found at a home in Limerick within the Republic of Ireland on Tuesday. Her body was identified by her family yesterday. Detectives from the PSNI have been working with the Irish Garda with the investigation. He's due to appear today at Belfast Magistrates Court. The United States is promising to train Taiwan's armed forces as China continues military exercises around the island Beijing claims as its territory. The chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Michael McCall, also pledged to speed up the delivery of weapons, saying it's important that democracies stand together. China's military drills began a day after Taiwan's president visited the United States. Earlier today, 42 Chinese fighter jets briefly crossed into Taiwan's territory. North Korea has conducted tests on an underwater nuclear attack drone, according to the country's state media. The test is the latest show of force against the US and South Korea. Photographs aired by broadcaster KRT show the drone exploding beneath the surface. It comes just a week after Pyongyang disclosed it had the technology enabling sneak attacks in enemy waters. Nine in ten teachers say their workload has increased over the last year. According to a new survey, teachers work an average of 54 hours a week, with around 13 of these outside of the normal school day. The teachers' union suggests that 83% believe their job has adversely affected their mental health over the last year. Chris McGovern is chairman for the Campaign for Real Education. He told us pay improvements are needed. Teaching is an energising job, or it should be. And if it's depressing you, you shouldn't be in the job because good teachers have to be happy teachers. And, of course, happy teachers have to be well paid. But, you know, within the school budget, there is plenty of money to pay teachers a good salary. The majority of staff in schools are not teachers. So we need to shift some of the money from the non-teaching staff to the teachers and we can solve the problem. But that's called thinking outside the box. And the Department for Education, which I've advised over decades, isn't very good at that, I'm afraid. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. So let's get back to Esther and Phil. Thank you, Ray. Now, lots of your views have been coming in, particularly about the changing of the guidance for sentencing mm. in Scotland and that you've got to be uh, 25 because the brain isn't fully uh, matured or functioning otherwise. So John says, if people haven't got fully functioning brains until the 25, surely under 25 should not be allowed to vote, allowed to marry or have children, allowed to drink alcohol, allowed to drive, uh, given positions of authority of any sort whatsoever. What a load of nonsense he finishes with. Julian says, if the SNP government do not think the brain is fully developed until 25 years old, their argument for not jailing the young, then why have the SNP lowered the voting age to 16? Perhaps this is why the SNP are in power, people voting for them with underdeveloped brains. <laughs> <laughs> Authorised opinion there, Julian. <laughs> and lots of those are pretty much all yes, along the same line, saying, of course, you, you, you know, you're developed at 25. But look, here we are again, joined in the studio by Matthew Lazar, former head of broadcasting for the Labour Party, and Charlie Rowley, former special advisor to Michael Gove. Where shall we go to first? Shall we start with you this time, Charlie? Sure. Um, a couple of stories here. One um, a slightly more serious than the other, but it's about uh, on the back of the Easter weekend that we're all enjoying. On Tuesday, we're going to see more doctors strike, uh, doctors and nurses strike in the NHS, uh, which is going to be even more problematic than the last set of strikes we saw because uh, typically after the Easter bank holiday weekend, this time last year, the NHS received 70,000 more phone calls than it would typically on a Monday to Friday uh, the, during a typical week. Um, and so it receives those calls... Uh, more so than it does uh, at any other time. But what is significant about this story is that the NHS feel that it won't get the cover that it had last time, so it won't be able to bring in uh, additional support to fund those calls or to see uh, people through uh, any trips or falls that they might have had over the Easter weekend. Do you think this dedication has changed these younger sort of people, younger doctors, seem more militant? But has dedication changed? We did a story just before that to get young people into work now, we're having to bribe them basically with Fridays off, extra, I don't know, invitations to uh, things. What is going wrong? I mean, they take an oath. Do no harm first. Do no harm. That is their... What's going on with these young people? 
Yeah, and I think, um, look, you know, you've got to uh, uh, appreciate where the government was coming from when it wants to put in a minimum service requirement. So to make sure that anybody and everybody in this country pays their taxes fairly, you should be able to rely um, uh, and in the full knowledge that if you have a, an accident or if you need that medical attention at any time, you're going to get it. Um, and I think this just um, sends fear and worry across the nation when they see people walking out uh, when it comes to pay and working I... conditions, when actually a lot of money does go into the NHS. It needs reform. Yes, we need to appreciate and pay our doctors and nurses, but there's, it's a two-way street. Matthew, I, I wondered, does, does this kind of strike action cause a problem for the Labour Party in terms of knowing whether they want to support the people who are on strike, because obviously they, that's their natural instinct, but knowing that how much it inconveniences the public and how annoyed they might be if people are looking for some treatment and they can't get it. Does, does it does it put particularly the Labour Party in a difficult position, this strike act? Yeah, I mean, I think every strike puts the Labour Party in a difficult position, but the NHS particularly is the sort of Labour's um, sacred cow. It, it, it's tricky. I mean, on nurses, because the public always support nurses, whatever they do. On doctors, I think the, the, there is a big problem because some of the public see doctors, because obviously senior doctors are pretty well paid, um, and also the dissatisfaction with GPs at the moment. Um, famously, uh, John Reid, when he was health secretary of Blast in the past, he famously stuffed the GP's mouths with gold. Remember, the, mm -hmm. when, remember when GP, your local GP, covered the evenings and weekends? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're dating memory. ourselves by saying that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I think, it, you know, it is, it is a really tricky path for Labour to be seen to be on the side of patients, um, uh, whilst also quite a lot of the, the, the sort of membership and the sort of party's core supporters would have some sympathy with the doctors. I think there's an issue about this kind of try... The, the old thing wasn't you were very poor as a junior doctor, but you got the jag as soon as you became a consultant. I think that nowadays the, uh, they're not prepared to put the pain in and maybe they don't, you know. So maybe we're looking at having to reduce salaries at the senior end and sort of change that whole model. But so maybe it needs radical reform, which nobody's talking about. Has the BMA gone more militant, more radicalised? I think certainly it seems that the uh, that there is a very organised group of uh, of younger doctors who, who are trying to do this, and who I think they're specifically talking about. It's always never regarded itself as a trade union. It's always been too posh for that. Uh, who specifically use language saying we want it to be trade unionised, uh, more like normal trade unions. And, and it's not. I mean, you know, maybe they'll end up giving money to the Labour Party one day, <laughs> like the other unions. If they your... get the thirty-five percent pay exactly. right, you need to make sure. What that. was your story? Mine was Mr. Loophole. Don't you remember him? Mm. He was the solicitor who seemed to get everybody off. Their speeding fines, as it were. But on this one, he's taken a look at this desire for people to have, I don't even know if the 20 is plenty campaign, so you drive slower, not 30 miles an hour, but 20 miles an hour. But what he's saying is having an a, a unintended consequence of people think because you're going so slowly, actually they're being uh, doing other things at the wheel, so they are more inclined to use the phone. They say there's got this competing thing that, A, you're going slower, but there's lots going on in your life and you want to get there quicker, but you're driving slower, so you end up doing more dangerous things like using your phone. So I've got to, what do you think? Do you think he's got a point there? I think so. I mean, we've all been in those situations where you're doing something, well, you know, if you're on autopilot, to put it into that context, when <laughs> driving, and you're a very good driver, you just tend to drive. But if you're having to think about other things, so going even slower than you normally would, and as you say, if you're thinking, well... I should be doing, something, should be doing else. something else. I should else. be elsewhere. The, the, you know, that builds up a, a certain amount of anxiety, a rush. You know, you're in, you know, trying to get from A to B. It does play havoc, probably, with with, with people's. That's um, what he was saying. Driving. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's like low traffic neighbourhoods. We've also seen today the um, the smart motorways are, are rearing their head again with the AA upping their calls for them to be scrapped. I think sometimes things seem like a good idea, uh, and people jump on the bandwagons. It's a bit like um, it's a bit like uh, I'm, I can't I can't drive. So it's a bit like the issue at the moment, which is all cities are going mad for these floating bus stops where you put the you put the um, cycle lane first, then the bus stops in the middle, so you have a little crossing, but no cyclists will stop for the poor people using the bus. So you get mown down by a delivery driver. Um, uh, so it just it was people to jump on a bandwagon. I'm always in favour of taking a breath, seeing if it actually works, rather than saying, it sounds like a good idea, let's do it everywhere. You see, I've, I've got a theory on this, which would be an unpopular one, but most of my theories are. Uh, I mean, obviously people... That's why I love you, mate. <laughs> why I love you. It's, it, I mean, obviously people shouldn't drive with a mobile phone, and, and hopefully there's been a change in culture. I don't know how big the, ch the change in culture has been. And my theory is, is that if using a mobile phone was allowed then people would have their mobile phone up here uh, where everybody could see, and they could also have a chance of keeping mm. their eye on the road at the same time. Now it's banned. If anyone is using the mobile phone, they can't do that because they're going to get six points on the licence and Lord knows all the rest of it. So they have the phone down here, 
fiddling about with it, and they're not even looking at the road. And I've a, I just have a that's feeling... That's even more dangerous, that it's, that it's, that's going to get dangerous. people. Those people who are actually still using a mobile phone, it's now it's more dangerous that it's banned than if it wasn't banned. Well, I'm looking forward to self-driving cars. I've been in one on one of the tests. Um, uh, and, uh, that's just because you haven't got your driving well, yeah, license. Yeah, I was doing a project on it, but, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, and the problem is, at the moment, they can't quite... They, um, they, they Dogs they can notice, but cats and birds. So he, <laughs> the poor guy did have to keep, uh, keep, keep, keep going back to the controls. And they're, they're also not very good on so roundabouts. It's a roundabout way, way of saying, yes, I'd like to be able to use my mobile phone, so I'm yes. going to wait for <laughs> Absolutely. a self-drive car. Well, you're lucky you can drive at all at the minute in and out of London with the users. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 I, I tell you, that, that is a disastrous mm. Sorry, we've got clean air zones in Bradford we've as got, well. We've so they, they've got them, them everywhere, but that is something, again, that needs to be looked at, and the mayor's doing... Uh, it's a disaster. Anyway, go on. Another story. Oh, should I turn to Philip? No, Matthew. Matthew, Matthew. Oh, go on. Go on. Well, look, uh, following on from, from being in Scarborough, uh, as we were, I'm, I'm told that Whitby has the best fish and yes. chips, so Scarborough has the best mm. view. Uh, as, a Lanc as a Lancashire <laughs> man, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to con concede that. But on the front of all papers today, the FT is a story about um, the problems with our supply of, uh, of fish, and uh, the nation's fish, uh, fish and chip shop owners are worried about it because apparently over 10% of our cod uh, traditionally comes from Russia. Okay. Um, and uh, there's a 35% import uh, t tariff on it because, obviously, of sanctions in Ukraine. So, remember rock salmon? Mm. Yeah. It's making a comeback. It's been banned for over a decade uh, on environmental grounds, but apparently... And it's not a Brexit bonus because we're doing it in concert with the EU. So, um, uh, uh, so together with the EU, um, we're gonna be, fishermen are going to be allowed to catch it. It's actually called spur dog, so rock salmon was the posh... So what, what, what was it. it banned for? It was banned because apparently it's, um, the way it spawns is that the, 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 the it's getting depleted because it, they have very... Apparently they can be pregnant for 22 months. Can you get bat around it? That's the question. Oh, yeah, oh, you can get bat around your rock can salmon. Can you get, can absolutely. You get bat around it? And, and, and uh, absolutely. But, but, um, but apparently it's actually a small, a small form of shark, but they always called it rock salmon to make it sound more appetising. There is actually some good news here, actually, Matthew, because if you, if you, if you not, can't have your fish and chips, apparently, page three of The Sun today, it says here that pies make you happier by boosting <laughs> feel-good chemicals in the brain, according to food experts, particularly steak and kidney pie oh. is the biggest mood lifter of all. So. What about steak and kidney pudding, which is, uh, is, is, oh, is, 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 you know, is my favourite and is, you don't see so much... Because it's um, sewered absolutely. rather than pasty. Yeah. Well, pies I'm, certainly make me happier. I'm until steak Esther... and ale rather than steak and kidney. Uh, they make me steak happier and until Esther mm. nags me for putting on too oh, much this, weight. Oh, this is rubbish. Steak, <laughs> OK, steak and, steak and ale. What are you? Steak and ale. Are you steak and ale? Yeah, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, uh, same kidney pudding or chicken and leek pie. Uh, but the, mm -hmm. and then the other thing is, I have mine with mashed potato and mushy peas, and Esther has hers with chips, chips and, and veg. vegetables. It's got to be chips. I think I think we need chips and veg. Thank you. Oh, I like a bit of mustard mash. I'm into making a bit of mustard mash. Oh, you can tell the southern. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you can so come you, over, come over and try it. You've got that <laughs> story you were looking at. I've got a story here. Now I, I found this a very confusing one. It's page 24 of the Daily Star. So it must be true. Uh, blokes are getting beard transplants in a bid to look older, so they're taken more seriously. Last year, there were 28,000 beard transplants globally, up from just 1,600 in 2005. And the top hair transplant surgeon, Dr Manish Mittal, says some men in their 30s look, uh, think an older look will bring them... Success, and there's a chap here who paid, forked out three thousand pounds. Could somebody such a explain to transplant? me how you do a beard transplant? Why don't you I mean, just grow it, one? No, well, no, if you can't, I, I get that. If you can't oh, fully grow one, so are we putting just tattoos, little, little black marks I, on your face? Are we I, actually I'd putting never... hair into your face? Surely this is not a good. Oh, I saw Elton John this week, uh, so hair transplants were on my mind. <laughs> well, guys, but would you do that? Would you? I mean, you've got a baby. You've got a young face, there, Charlie. Thank you but very would you, much. No, but to, but but I get that. Say you say, oh, intellectually, I'm sort of much older than I appear, but I need people for my job to think that I do have that intellectual capability. Would you therefore go for a beard? And have, <laughs> I would stick one on. It, I, I wouldn't necessarily go for a beard, but I think you're absolutely right. Sometimes, you know, if you want to um, be seen to be taken seriously, and it's a terrible thing that you have to feel as though that you need to be taken seriously by what you wear or, or how you look. But I might put my glasses on occasionally just to look like like Philip to look a bit more intellectual. Not the, no, no, no. He's seen through my. He's seen through it. <laughs> well, <laughs> when you're as challenged as I am, you have to put the glasses on so you don't look. Too. But, but it's my excuse for taking it seriously why I didn't shave this morning. But first impressions do count, yeah, mm, and absolutely. people will say, you know, I I I need to look. Or I don't know. What 
whatever. Well, I, I mean, authority I'll take people, more, are people but, taken more seriously with a beard. I mean, but do you remember in politics? It worked for Jeremy Corbyn. Well, in the, in the, well, in the Blair years, do you remember that it was, there was the sort of the, the, it was thought that anybody with a with any facial hair wasn't going to get in the cabinet. You're sort of half and half. Have you got? Well, you've yeah, sort of got of designer stuff. A designer stuff. Back to the eighties. Mrs. Thatcher wouldn't promote anybody with a beard either. She wouldn't. Yeah. But now, you know, maybe that's about to change. Anyway, the hipsters in the cabinet. There you go. If you haven't heard of it before, you have now, now a beard transplant. Now, this is a much more serious uh, okay. story. This is something that got me riled this week, and this is this Thomas Cashman mm. who murdered uh, Olivia Pratt Corbell, and he didn't go back to court for his sentencing. And there's calls there that you must make it now, like compulsory change the law and get them there for their sentencing. I have a slightly different approach. and I think if you don't go for your sentencing, it should become a statutory aggravating yeah. factor to your sentencing and yeah. give them an extra whatever 10%. Because what I wouldn't want him to do is come back to court and be very arrogant yeah. and dismissive of what either the family have got to say, the impact statements or the judgment he was given. And by goodness, he was given a, a big sentence of 42 years. So I just wonder what people think forced mm. to get that sentence or increase the sentence if you're not there. Yeah, well, it was a total insult to the family, um, and it was utter cowardice on this man's part mm. because uh, justice has to be done in these cases, but it also has to be seen to be done. And I think the fact that he couldn't turn up uh, to the dock to receive that, hand, uh, that sentence handed down from the judge uh, in full light of the family, uh, who would have wanted to see that pass to him as well, I think, um, I think it's an absolute disgrace. And I think that you, it could be looked at absolutely to extend a sentence where uh, you've committed such an abhorrent crime uh, and fail to play your part in the justice system of taking that uh, sentence and, 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 as I say, and you were right. Done. He was a coward. He sobbed when he was convicted and then didn't show up. Matthew, what would you oh, Well, I think that's a great idea about extending the sentence because I think you're right. There is a, there's a possibility that people, they sort of martyrdom and, you know, standing uh, 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 in the dock while the sentence is handed down in a sort of, you know, having had you literally forced there. So I think that extending the uh, sentence if you don't come is, uh, is a very good idea because I think the danger is, is that, you know, every Tom, Dick and Harry in prison now wants to see themselves as the big man and refuses to do it, that this becomes a sort of this becomes a thing mm. uh, and I think that would be insulting to victims of all sorts of crimes. Mm, that's a very good point. Thank you both very much Thank indeed you. for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Now, coming up, a new scandal hits the SNP as former Chief Executive Peter Morrill and Nicola Sturgeon's husband was arrested and later released on Wednesday. And then the auditors quit. But has this impacted the polls? Matthew Goodwin will join us with the latest figures of what's going on there after all of this debacle in Scotland. Hello, good morning. The fine weather is going to continue for many as we go through today with some dry, sunny and warm weather for most of us, but things will turn more unsettled as we head towards the end of the long weekend. The reason for the settled conditions is this air of high pressure dominating the picture across the UK currently, but weather fronts waiting out in the Atlantic will reach us as we go through Sunday and later into Monday. Take a look at the picture first thing, and there is some mist and fog across southern parts to watch out for this morning. Also some cloud and outbreaks of rain across eastern northeastern parts of the UK. Elsewhere, it's a largely dry and sunny picture. The cloud in the northeast should break up a little bit, so increasing amounts of sunshine as we head into the afternoon. And in that sunshine, feeling pleasantly warm. Temperatures may be a touch higher than yesterday with highs of around 16 or 17 Celsius. Across parts of Northern Ireland, it is going to be a bit cloudier and that cloud increasing as we go through the day with winds strengthening here too because of this front trying to push in from the west. We will then see a few outbreaks of rain here later on and some outbreaks of rain for Western Scotland overnight too. Otherwise though, it's looking like a largely dry night, perhaps a bit cloudier than some recent nights. As a result, it may not be quite as cold, though there's the potential for a touch of frost in the most prone spots where we get any clear skies. So Sunday then, getting off to a dry start for most of us. There will be some outbreaks of rain through the morning across parts of Scotland, but they're going to clear their way northwards. Otherwise, and whilst it will be a little bit cloudier than recently, I'm expecting some decent sunshine, particularly across England and Wales, as we head through the middle part of the day. Temperatures with that sunshine will again be on the warm side, so highs of around 17 or 18 Celsius. But notice this wet weather arriving from the west. That's then going to sweep its way eastwards as we go through Sunday night into to Monday, bringing a real change to something more unsettled through the rest of the week. There's the potential for something stormy to arrive later Tuesday into Wednesday, with temperatures taking a bit of a dip too.
it's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit off. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. my political ambitions are, <laughs> those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay it down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yeah, it's right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers. <laughs> Tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. I'll spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We've got a brand new lineup every Saturday night on GB News. From 6 p.m., I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8 p.m. as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Brand new Saturday nights on GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's almost 11.26. Uh, welcome back to Saturday Morning with Esther and Phil. Now, former SNP chief executive and Nicola Sturgeon's husband, Peter Morell, uh, was arrested and later released on Wednesday. Yesterday, the accountants which audit SNP accounts resigned. This comes as the police continue their investigation into the party's finances. Well, we're joined now by Matt Goodwin, a professor of politics and international relations at the University of Kent. So what a period of time it's been for the SNP. We had that gender recognition bill. We've now got this investigation into finances. Uh, it's all looking very murky indeed. But is this reflecting in the polls? How are the public seeing what's going on? Well, I saw somebody this morning um, has written that this is the biggest crisis for the SNP in 50 years, and I think that's probably right. Obviously, we saw the fallout of Nicola Sturgeon's departure. We now know, or it's at least been alleged, that SNP officials were meeting with um, police before that departure, which raises a series mm -hmm. of enormous questions about whether or not that, that resignation um, you know, was was staged uh, or timed in a way that would benefit um, the SNP and minimise damage. So that's being explored. And we know that we've got some pretty ugly questions about the £600,000 in donations. So when you put all of this together, I think this is a really difficult moment for the SNP. If you look at the polling on the um, Scottish Parliament election, the party's lead has collapsed from 
where it was in 2021, which was uh, 26 points. It's now down to about 10 points. Um, and since the change in leadership within the SNP, uh, we've not yet had a single poll that's had support for independence ahead of opposition. So it looks like this might also be undermining the broader case for Scotland's independence. So I think this is a really big existential moment for the SNP, actually, Esther. I mean, Matthew, it's, I mean, you say that the, the support's collapsed from a lead of 26 points to 10 points. It's still quite a healthy advantage in political terms, isn't it? A 10-point advantage, given everything that's been going on. I mean, are things like digging up the front garden of the First Minister and her husband's uh, house, I mean, are, are they sort of Westminster Village, Holyrood Village stories, or do they actually change the way people vote? Well, I suspect that there are lots of people that are going to be watching this story thinking, well, hang on a minute, wasn't Nicola Sturgeon spending much of the last two years attacking Westminster for, for rule-breaking and hypocrisy? And I think there is an element of, in this story about Nicola Sturgeon's legacy now becoming as intimately tied up with, with potential rule-breaking as, as some of the politicians she, she's been opposing. So I think the hypocrisy in this will, will end up making a difference. And I also think more generally, if you look at the the polling in Scotland about what people feel the SNP is interested in. They feel the SNP is overwhelmingly interested in independence, but voters say they want a government that's going to deal with issues like health, schools, the cost of living. And I think this is what tends to happen in one-party states, which basically Scotland's become. The government sort of loses touch with the country and begins to indulge in its obsessions, like the gender recognition reform bill, which was only really supported by about one in five voters and alienated the vast majority of Scots and Brits, by the way. Um, so overall, I think this is one of those um, episodes that, that is likely to inflict some pretty significant damage on the SNP and create room for either Labour or the Conservatives to come back at the next election. Matt, for a while it seemed the SNP were untouchable and they seemed to have ultimate control out of over everything, and there was like a power base there between Nicola Sturgeon and her husband. And I just wondered whether people will start looking into all this now, because for me to have had your chief executive of a party in control of the money and, as your wife, the leader of the party, surely people should have been looking at conflict of interests there, people should have been looking at vested interests there. So is it going to get worse for the SNP and for their polling in the community and in Scotland? I suspect it will do. I think Fraser Nelson made this point in the papers yesterday, that in what kind of democracy would you have the governing party essentially dominated by a husband and wife team. I mean, there's an obvious conflict of interest there. And so I think there are going to be a number of big questions that are going to um, emerge and continue to be explored over the next few weeks. When did people know that things uh, weren't right? What was the interaction between the police and the SNP in Scotland? How much did Nicola Sturgeon know? What happened to the 600 thousand pounds in donations for an independence campaign, which which clearly wasn't spent on that campaign. So these are all questions that I think are going to rumble on. And it's also important to note that the new leader um, uh, who's taken over from Nicola Sturgeon, I think it's fair to say that actually there is a, a widespread view that, that Sturgeon's successor might not have the same political acumen, the same political skill set as, say, Alex Salmond or Nicola Sturgeon did. So I think this is also going to be a testing time for the new leadership within the SNP if it's going to try and get this party back on track and, 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 and then beyond that begin to get the campaign for independence back on, on track, because that looks very difficult at the moment. Matthew Goodwin, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. We'll have to get Matthew back on. There's so much there, isn't it? They want the rerun now of the leadership contest. What will happen with Alba be the new party? How is Alex Salmond feeling today? But Vindicated also, in some way or another? Also, Scotland could be the key to Labour getting a majority at the next election if they win back all of those seats that they lost from the, to the SNP um, a few is. years ago. So there's, there's it's a massive, important issue for the whole country, what's going on in Scotland. Still to come on Saturday morning with Esther and Phil, we'll be joined by the chairman of the Justice Select Committee, Sir Bob Neill MP, who wants almost 3,000 prisoners to have their sentences reviewed. But first, here's the news headlines with Ray.
32 minutes past 11, here's the latest. The Foreign Office is calling for a de-escalation in tensions between Israel and Palestinians after British citizens were caught up in a series of attacks. One Italian tourist was killed and eight people, reportedly including UK nationals, were injured after a car ploughed into pedestrians in Tel Aviv. Meanwhile, two British-Israeli sisters were killed in the West Bank after their car was targeted in a gun attack near an Israeli settlement. Their mother is also in a critical condition. Labour says tens of thousands of serious offenders have been spared jail while the Conservatives have been in government. The party claims that since 2010, more than 16,000 adults convicted of child pornography offences and 130 rapists have been handed community punishments or suspended sentences. Labour is facing criticism over its latest campaign. The party has previously accused Rishi Sunak of not believing that child sex offenders should be locked up. The United States is promising to train Taiwan's armed forces as China continues military exercises around the island that Beijing claims as its territory. The chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Michael McCall, also pledged to speed up the delivery of weapons, saying it's important that democracies stand together. China's military drills began a day after Taiwan's president visited the US. Earlier today, 42 Chinese fighter jets briefly crossed into Taiwan's territory. We're on TV, online on DAB Plus Radio and, of course, on TuneIn too. This is GB News. Back to Esther and Phil in just a moment. Thanks there, Ray. Now, coming up, King Charles has formally sent out invites to his coronation. We'll be speaking to a local community hero has, who has just been invited to that coronation for all the services they did during the pandemic. How exciting would that mm, be? Brilliant. Absolutely. Don't go anywhere. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it. Like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know Kate Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Day. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. 
I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Welcome back at 11.38. Now, around 850 community and charity representatives from across the United Kingdom have been invited by King Charles to enjoy the coronation service uh, at Westminster Abbey on Saturday, the 6th of May. We're joined now by GB News national reporter Theo Chicomba, who is outside Westminster Abbey, to give us the latest on the coronation invites. Yes, well, what better way to prepare for the coronation on the 6th of May than to be invited by King Charles. 850 people from in and around the UK have been invited uh, to see the service um, here at Westminster Abbey. Now, this includes people who have received British Empire medals, uh, community champions and those who work in the charity sector. That includes young people as well. Some of these people, particularly during COVID, raised money for members of their local community and went above and beyond, particularly helping those who were finding it challenging during the coronavirus pandemic and more. So in a couple of weeks' time, they'll be preparing uh, their best suits and dresses uh, to come along uh, and sit and enjoy the coronation here. It's expected 27 million people will be watching it on television, 11 million people uh, hearing it on the radio, and those numbers don't include those who will be watching it uh, around the globe as well. MPs and peers have also been invited and they'll be here as well. It's been a long held tradition that the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, officiates this coronation service and this year is no different. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, will be officiating uh, this service uh, just in a couple of weeks' time. So a huge event on the horizon. Many of those who've received their invites will be looking forward to that weekend very, very soon. Theo, thank you very much indeed for that. Now we're delighted to be joined by Manju Mully, who has been invited to King Charles' coronation for her services to the community in London during the COVID-19 response. Well, I have to say, what was it like when you received that invitation? In what form did it come? Where were you? Who did you tell? There's loads of things I want to know. Well, Esther, we're in the 21st century, so it was electronically sent to me. And I thought it was a spam email, <laughs> being the 21st century. So I ignored it for a few days. <laughs> and then uh, they said, Manju, do you want to come to the coronation or not? And I thought, oh my gosh, yes, yes, yes. So hence, uh, I'm there. I'm going to be there on that really special day. So who was the first? Once you realised it wasn't spam or it wasn't somebody having a hoax and you actually opened it, who was the first person you called to say, you never guess what? Because my phone would be red hot with me telling people I'd been invited. <laughs> well, well, I wasn't sure whether I meant to tell anyone. I told mum, my mum, and she went, oh, OK. She also wasn't sure what kind of an invite it was. Was it, you know, to someone's party or something? And... Uh, then I told a few of my friends and my cooking classes, you see, because uh, I said, well, I might not be able to make it. So I told my uh, cooking class friends and my colleagues that I can't make it on that day to do any cooking. <laughs> and what, so, do you actually, <laughs> what do you actually get invited to? What, what, what will happen for, for you? What, what will you go to? Well, obviously, Everything is still sort of under wraps and it's unfolding as we get closer. But from what I can gather, we have to be in London for 7 a.m. Oh. And uh, the dress code has been sent to us. I want well. to know so, that. What's uh, know. that? What's the dress code? It's day dress. There's a selection. So I'll be picking a day dress. <laughs> and uh, one of my mates, uh, she's a local girl, Gita Handa, she's going to make some little bespoke outfit for me. So... I better get on the diet quickly. 
OK, so you're arriving at seven. You're in day dress. Um, can you take anybody? Have you got a plus one? And, and, and from 7 a.m., any, any more info you can give us? No info at this stage. Uh, just uh, no plus one either. So it's all on my Todd, uh, on the local transport, <laughs> in an outfit, uh, going to the Abbey. And is there any special requirements on that invitation or are there things they've said you cannot do? Is there any? They haven't said that, but I suppose I can wear one of these, which is my uh, British Empire medal. And uh, that's what I'll be wearing with the other 449 people who are going to be with me. So there has been no restrictions as such. Uh, I'm sure there'll be like photography restrictions and uh, telephone restrictions, but I suppose it'll be like a kind of a, an international service, if you know what I mean. I mean, it's a terrific honour and I think it's fantastic and it's a, you know, it's a, a day that you'll never forget. I just want to be honest with me now. Would you have preferred that invite to have come through the post in some fancy, you know, card or whatever that you could have put on the mantelpiece and kept forever rather than a, an email? It's, you know, surely you would have preferred a, an, an old-fashioned invite. I'm sure one is on the way. <laughs> but, oh. yeah, it's lovely. It's just... <laughs> Just to have that framed, it'll be great. It'll be a, a piece of history. And uh, hopefully it'll be a piece of history for all of us in Great Britain. That kind of sense of belonging and being together and being part of a very special day, regardless of whether you're a royalist or a republican. I'm quite sure you are going to get that invitation because a lot was made of this invitation, wasn't it? I think the man is Andrew Jameson, who designed it. It was a competition. Oh, he took a whole month to do it. His theme was on, I think it was meadows and, um, yes, wasn't it? It was wildflowers and meadows with all the sort of royal colours in there. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the invite? Is that, am I right in saying that? Did you get that email to you looking like that? No, we haven't. I've seen it uh, in the news, unless I haven't checked my post. But it's a beautiful invite. It's stunning, absolutely stunning. It, it's very natural and organic. It, it, it's so different. It is austere, but not blingy ostentatious, if you know what I mean. It's just simple, down to earth, and here it is, and the sort of calligraphy is amazing. But I haven't seen it in person. <laughs> Uh, well, look, thank you so much for joining us. Maybe you can join us again afterwards to tell us yes, what the it. day yeah, was like, because now I think there seems to be a lot under wraps. Yeah. And obviously you're a very special person because of all the special work you did uh, during Thank you so COVID. much. Thank you. Yes, thank you for joining us. Oh. Brilliant, though, isn't it? Get an invite to the coronation. Well I, was, well, I was reading all about this Andrew Jameson and how good he was and what he studied and he does heraldic painting, calligraphy and manuscripts and what have you, and he uh, won it. Mm. He won the competition. Mm. Fair enough. OK. Now let's take a look at the biggest stories from the world of sport and showbiz with the wonderful duo of Chris Scudder <laughs> and the lovely Hayley Palmer. Lovely to see you both you. here. Um, nice talk, to see you again. Talking about um, talk, talking about um, beautiful designs and everything, you, you you quite like my tie, don't you? Tim? Well, I, well, it wasn't it wasn't me. I think the audience were think, shocked and like they it. said, um, "It's catching my eye." Well, the thing was, I think most of the audience were saying, "What does Phil's tie remind us of?" And then. Hmm. We were like, oh, I, I don't know. What does it remind us of? Can and I then say, somebody said, go on, what go. do you think? Battenberg cake. Oh, yeah, uh, that's my oh, favourite. Oh, all right, Battenberg yeah, cake. that's it. And then somebody said... We've got a winner, we've got a winner, though, No, but we? somebody said it wasn't Battenberg cake, mm. but I'm with you on that, because mm, I have to one, love that. Battenberg cake. Yeah. It's actually Elmer the Elephant. Oh! Yeah, look, well, there you go. Right. There you go. Oh, that's it. Or, or... That's it, yeah. Harlequin's rugby shirt. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah, well, I suppose, I mean, yeah, fair enough. So yeah. many of our viewers were thinking that tie I, is driving wow. us wild can or I, crazy, can, one can, of the two. Can I just say that minute for people on radio has been a complete disaster for them. <laughs> like, what is going on? Lots of them. bright colours. Well, yeah, yeah, bright yeah. squares going in different directions. Um, if you had a hangover, you don't want to look at that tie. That's yeah. all I'm saying. It would make you go a bit sort of the squishy. Height of, the height of fashion. <laughs> Mind you, it does go with the colours on your, on your outfit. Yeah, we're loving all the bright colours today. It's Easter. It's spring, isn't it? 
Chris. Thank so you what, what, what's the top what's the top sports story today? Uh, it depends when you look ahead or back, really. But I mean, you Burnley celebrating promotion last mm. night. You know, uh, uh, great stat this. Uh, Good Friday last year, they sacked Sean Dyche, who's now Everton from your neck of the woods. One year on, they get promoted back to the Premier League. Lost a load of players last year. They, had, they owed 60 million. Uh, they've got new owners as well. But everyone thought they're just going to vanish now. Absolutely romped to the title in, mm. in the championship with uh, Vincent Company, who learned the trade as a coach under as a player under Pep Guardiola. So uh, they're going to be in the Premier League next year, playing some good football. So um, and today it's all about scrambling at the bottom. Who's going to get relegated? Because mm. you know you got Man City and Arsenal at the top. Who's going to win the league? Um, could go either way still. But at the bottom. You've got seven clubs separated by three points. One of yeah. those is going to go. Bournemouth playing Leicester today. You've got uh, Leeds v Palace. Um, all the teams playing each other. So it's like a proper dogfight. Whoever's got up for, the, up for the fight is probably going to survive. And they're all nervous, like West Ham fans. You know, are we going to get relegated? Well, you know, just get, get stuck in and see what happens. We, yeah, we had Harry Redknapp on the show earlier talking about his nephew, Frank Lampard. Being... Frank's back today, yeah. yeah what, what do you make of that appointment? Um, I think it's a no-lose for Frank, certainly. Uh, it's no-lose for the club as well because, you know, that, that, who are they going to... Nobody in their right mind is going to go in there for, for four or five games and tarnish their reputation. So... They've brought in a player who, ex-player, now a manager, who I think the players will respect. I mean, you have to feel, feel really sorry for, for, for Graham Potter who got the sack. Yeah. You know, I, I say that because he came in, great reputation, and the, and the owners just said, here's 10 players who you've probably never heard of. Now make it work. I mean, ridiculous. I mean, so yeah. Frank's come in now. He's got nothing to lose. He, he lost his job at Everton. Um, they've got a European Cup semi-final, uh, quarter-final uh, against Real Madrid next week. But I think the players might respond to him. Yeah, Harry said Harry's it's ready, all about... He's ready for a, a move back to Spurs, yeah, he isn't said, he? He said now us. people are coming back in to uh, manage at Burr's age, 70, 75, he's coming back. But he did say confidence is key. Mm. And he said yeah. that's what he needs to do, enjoy it, and confidence he is will, key. Yeah, I'm sure Frank is a lovely fellow. Lovely fellow, Frank. But, but, you know, I think the players might respond to him. I do think so. Before I start, I just want to give a shout out to Aidan McGee today because he's in hospital. He's uh, at the Princess Royal University Hospital and he's currently changing wards at the moment. And apparently he's making rubbish jokes to the nurses. Really? That's a shot. Are you going to visit him? Oh, uh, well. Take him an Easter egg to yeah, we'll take him a little Cadbury's cream egg. Now that'll brighten his day up if you turn up. A little you. mini one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you show stories? Yes, yeah, so I want to talk about uh, S Club. Mm. Um, it's front page of the papers today uh, that Paul uh, died. And it is such a shock because S Club had come back together for their 25th year anniversary tour. And um, I was looking at clips last night. I was actually watching a, a clip where he was on First Dates Hotel and also another clip when he was on Loose Swimming, where he was saying that he actually sold his uh, Brit Award. They, they won Best Newcomer and he was actually selling his award to get money. And, and my point here is that he was saying about the rise and the fall of fame. Like there was points where he had that fame and there was points where he sat on Loose Women and said, I literally we had to borrow my friend's shirt to come on here and I'm eating pot noodles and when I watched it it was mm, tragic, quite distressing um, to see I mean I, there was reports that he was quite quiet at times um, towards the later days I mean I, I, I'm really good friends with Jo I, I, I literally saw her about a month ago and I know how excited she was when I was talking to her about them all coming back together are Simon they still going to go ahead, are they still uh, gonna go ahead with it? I, I don't know if they will I mean oh there they are yeah I mean I, I hope that they do but you need to find out for us. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but I, I'm just so gutted for them because, like I say, I know when I spoke to Jo how excited she was about them coming back together and uh, I know all the fans um, are deeply saddened but to by this. other stories, competition within relationships? Yes. Oh, yes, this is uh, interesting because Alex Jones, she claims that her ex, Steve Jones, apparently they phoned up Steve and asked if uh, she could interview Angelina Jolie and he said, no, she's not available for the job. And he did it. Sorry, if that was my relationship, not OK. Not OK on any level. But would you, would you, would you put your relationship ahead of a job? Or... No, I'd put my job ahead of a relationship. Well that's, he, well, that's what he did. But I wouldn't have quite done that level. But uh, I, 
Yeah, I see what you're saying, but... You can't have it both ways. <laughs> I, th I mean, look, Chris, I mean, I would say that was the lowest of the low. Everybody would want to do that interview with Angelina Jolie. It goes to your other half and you... No, no, not you. Brutal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's not well, I'll do it. I mean... I mean I'll be you... asking about Brad straight away, though. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. But would you have done that? Would you have sort of got said, you, you know, my other half's ill, I'll do the an interview instead? No, you wouldn't. Not a nice like guy like you. It's a low trick, that, isn't it? What, do, you, do you put your... Yeah, belt? I was going to say, Esther, what you would you do? Your... the belt. It was do you well put your below relationship the belt? Before, before your job? Good question, Phil. No. No, love, obviously. Oh, oh that's why you two are relationship girls. No, uh, Philip's jaw nearly dropped there. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, she says no. that now, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. Can I tell you, no, that, that is wrong on so many levels. You should have been able to have had a conversation and say, do you know what, I'd love to do that interview more than you. Please, can I do... What do you, do you see what you mean? Because you the trust has completely have... gone, hasn't it? How no. could you ever trust him no, again? No, no. Uh, it's a uh, base bad one, over? Is that relationship Oh, that's over. Well that's over. well gone. Chris, yeah. can you keep us up to date with what's going on in the golf? The golf? Well, did you see the weather last night? Yes, it was terrible, <laughs> wasn't it? <laughs> is Rory McIlroy out of it the US? Be, yeah, is he, is yeah he he's not the... going to be there. He's not going to be there. He's five, five over par. The cut's going to come up plus two, probably. Uh, maybe a bit over. But they still haven't done a second round yet, so half the, half the field oh, right. has got to continue. They should be starting about, about an hour and a half, two hours from now. So the first people out will be the ones who didn't finish their rounds last night. And the forecast is terrible. Um, so there's, there's every chance that the, the thing might have to be finished on Monday. It's only happened five times, I think, in the history of the Masters. Um, and is it going to affect the result in the sense that people going yeah, out playing in the decent it, weather it, yeah, a massive right. advantage I mean, it's, yeah, to the exactly. ones? It's, 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 golf's always like that, though. Yeah, it's, it's like the Open. If you go out and it's really windy um, and then, it, then the sun comes out, it's just bad luck, you know. But um, So this guy, Brooks Kep Kep Kepko, who's leading at the moment, the American, who's one of these rebels that are playing on the, the Live mm. Tour, you know, this other tour that they've all gone for the money in Saudi Arabia. One of the guys who's been allowed to play in this in this major because there's been a big row and all suing each other, etc. He's leading. Um, Rory McIlroy out. He's out. There's an amateur in third place at the moment. Never been won by an amateur before. A guy called uh, Sam Bennett, 23 years old from Texas. Mm -hmm. A great story. If he won it, well, that would be brilliant. One of our favourite films I... is Phantom of the, the Open, Open, isn't it? it is. So oh. if you haven't seen that, it's a you must. fantastic, I haven't seen classic, it. classic film. Look, do you know what? That's all that we've got time for today. Haley, Chris, thank you very uh, much indeed. But we'll be back 10 a.m. next Friday. So stay tuned to GB News. Coming up next is GB News Saturday with Martin Daubney. You don't want to miss that. Hello, good morning. The fine weather is going to continue for many as we go through today with some dry, sunny and warm weather for most of us, but things will turn more unsettled as we head towards the end of the long weekend. The reason for the settled conditions is this air of high pressure dominating the picture across the UK currently, but weather fronts waiting out in the Atlantic will reach us as we go through Sunday and later into Monday. Take a look at the picture first thing, and there is some mist and fog across southern parts to watch out for this morning. Also some cloud and outbreaks of rain across eastern and northeastern parts of the UK. Elsewhere, it's a largely dry and sunny picture. The cloud in the northeast should break up a little bit, so increasing amounts of sunshine as we head into the afternoon. And in that sunshine, feeling pleasantly warm. Temperatures may be a touch higher than yesterday with highs of around 16 or 17 Celsius. Across parts of Northern Ireland it is going to be a bit cloudier and that cloud increasing as we go through the day with winds strengthening here too because of this front trying to push in from the west. We will then see a few outbreaks of rain here later on and some outbreaks of rain for Western Scotland overnight too. Otherwise though it's looking like a largely dry night, perhaps a bit cloudier than some recent nights. As a result it may not be quite as cold though there's the potential for a touch of frost in the most prone spots where we get any clear skies. So Sunday then, getting off to a dry start for most of us. There will be some outbreaks of rain through the morning across parts of Scotland, but they're going to clear their way northwards. Otherwise, and whilst it will be a little bit cloudier than recently, I'm expecting some decent sunshine, particularly across England and Wales, as we head through the middle part of the day. Temperatures with that sunshine will again be on the warm side, so highs of around 17 or 18 Celsius. But notice this wet weather arriving from the west. That's then going to sweep its way eastwards as we go through Sunday night into Monday, bringing a real change to something more under